My name is Pat Forsyth, and I'm a uh, Director of Neurosciences at Allergan Canada. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to speak to you today about patient-initiated communications and pharma's response to that. But before we get into the topic, I'd like to ask the following question. If you can bring the question up, please. If your 14-year-old wants you to teach them how to throw a curveball, where do you go to find that out? What do you do? Do you hire a professional pitching coach? Do you buy the book, Pitching for Dummies, at the local chapters outlet? Do you watch a YouTube video? Or do you buy season's tickets to the Blue Jays? <clears throat> oh, very good. So the true story is this. Last year, my 14-year-old, who's one of the pitchers on his baseball team, suddenly started striking out almost everybody. We went four or five games in a row, and I said to him, what are you doing differently? You're striking everybody, you're playing great. He goes, I've got a, I've got a curveball, Dad. I said, well, where'd you learn to throw a curveball? Did, did the coach show you that? He says, no, I went on YouTube. Now, I'm one of those guys that uh, I wasn't born after 1980, and I said, YouTube, let's take a look. So I went on YouTube. There's over 200 videos on how to throw a curveball on YouTube. So why am I telling you this story? The reason I'm telling you this story is because we now live in an, in, in, an electronic world, and it's not just my son who's looking for information on the internet, it's everybody and it's our patients. And what I'd like to talk about today is what are our patients doing and what is pharma's response being to that and how can we address that in the future. This is the traditional model. So the patient goes to see their physician. It's a controlled model, it's a regulated model, and it's channeled. It's channeled into the healthcare professional's office. But or sorry, and that model basically obviously has the healthcare professional holding all the cards. Uh, we have already established that we're living in an interactive world. And so what we're dealing with really is the empowered patient. And the empowered patient still goes to see their physician in our system eventually, but more often than not is going to the internet first. So it's controlled and it's regulated because the healthcare professional is still involved, but it's not as channeled as it used to be. There, the information out there is in many different places. If you look at the internet audience in Canada, there's uh, 23.8 million Canadians, or 72% of us are online. 80% of us have actually gone online to look for health information. And 55 to 59% of us have done it in the last three months. So it, it exists. Next question. In your opinion, what percentage of pharmaceutical companies are taking advantage of electronic media? 25, 50, 75, or 100. So most of you think about 25%. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it's probably a lot higher than that, and I'll tell you what that looks like right now. Next slide, please. Uh, in Canada, this is based on a uh, survey done by IBM in 2006 on 2,500 Canadians. 37% of Canadians attempt to diagnose themselves on the Internet. 37%. Uh, the main source of information for 3 in 10 Canadians is the Internet, and the Internet has surpassed physicians as the primary source of information in 2006. Now, the authors of the survey felt that that was going to level out and it would be about probably equal between physicians and the Internet in terms of their primary source. But uh, Canadians are definitely reliant on the web. So they're empowered. It, patients are taking their health into their own hands. Uh, and the Internet has become an important influencer in how they, they manage their health care. What has pharma done? Well, we continue to play on the sidelines for, for the most part, um, which is unfortunate because uh, the Internet actually contains a lot of contradictory information and patients are not necessarily well equipped to figure it out. So what's pharma's response being? Generally, pharma's response being is a product website. So we're going to be electronic, we'll be interactive, we'll put a website out there. And it's got product information, it's sometimes got some uh, reimbursement assistance, uh, there's some videos, there might be some programs, there's some links to other sites. Uh, but it's still very highly regulated, and there's not really that much that you can do. So what are the pros and cons of our response? It's definitely give, given us access to the electronic patient. So the electronic patient can get into these websites. Um, it's accurate. It links to other sites that might be of interest to the patient, and it starts to balance out some of that information that may not be correct. The cons are, if you're in Canada and you're a member of the general public, you can't get into these websites if you go to a, C, a .ca website. 
unless you have a DIN or a patient tablet number or something like that to prove that you actually have a prescription. Now, most people don't go to the .ca, they go to the .com, so you know, write the name of any brand name of any product and put .com and you'll find that website. So it is accessible to, to, to the customers. Uh, the sites, however, are viewed with a little bit of suspicion because they know that they're company-sponsored sites and they think that there possibly is a bias because you're trying to sell a product. Um, it's still a one-way broadcast of information. It's not really interactive. Uh, and it really is a tiny drop in a great sea of information that's out there. So we're doing something that's good. Uh, is it enough? Uh, the world continues to change. And you can see at the end there, we're kind of uh, reverting to uh, what we were millennia ago. Uh, these are the sources of medical information that exist that I've already covered. So in the middle, the healthcare professional. Uh, the internet has kind of taken over in the, in the last 20 years. But uh, outside of that second ring, is something that's been happening for the last few years and it's called social networking. And when I refer to social networking, I'm talking about uh, electronic social networking. So what is it? Well, it's the use of the internet to communicate, to socialize, to share ideas and exchange information, and it's done through blogs, it's done through bulletin boards, it's done through chat rooms, it's done through official social networks. Uh, it's very quickly becoming a very powerful tool to engage customers, to activate customers, and to make them move. And it's kind of what they say, viral marketing, or it's the buzz, it's the word of mouth marketing out there that patients are engaging in all the time. So our customers engage in this all the time, and what do we do about it? Well, if you look at uh, social networking itself, Facebook has 108 million users, registered users. MySpace, 81 million registered users. And LinkedIn, which I'm sure many of you are members of, has 15 million users. Um, are these things useful? Uh, very short time ago, uh, the new president of the United States was elected. And if you followed it closely, he had a website called myobama.com. And uh, it, was a, it was a MySpace website. And many people feel that he was able to engage and activate voters who never would have voted uh, through that social network. They think it was one of the reasons he won by such a large margin in the U.S. So these things are out there and they work. So should we be going on Facebook and MySpace? Well, we can be a little more sophisticated because there's a lot of medical networks out there that are already in existence. So things like Health Central, WebMD, Revolution Health, and the last two, Cure Together and Patients Like Me. Specific disease websites exist. So if you're a diabetes patient, there's many websites you can go to 